So yeah, we're gonna see some stuff. Pink oh, princess <laughs> crown. That's a teddy bear. <laughs> well, hello and welcome. This is the Ocean Cleanups little update show that we're doing during a very interesting time. And I'm right now joined by two of the leading ladies at the Ocean Cleanup. I'm gonna let you guys introduce yourself. I'll start with you, Lonica. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Lonneke, Lonneke Olierouk. I'm the Director of Operations. And hi all, my name is Eline and I'm the Program Manager for the River Program at the Ocean Cleanup. My name is Dan Vanderkoy. I work for the Communications Department. Now, as everyone can see, we are in a very unique setting right now. Like I'm talking to you from my kitchen, Lonica's on an ironing board and Elena's like in her living room. So. What, what is happening right now with the ocean cleanup? Like, where are we? Like the rest of the world, we're going through an extremely interesting time. But explain to us, I'll let you take this, Lonica. Like, just explain to us a little bit like what's happening right now in our organization. Yeah, the pandemic of the COVID-19 disease, uh, of course, has impacted the Netherlands. And our uh, headquarters based in Rotterdam have been affected by the measures that the Dutch government took. Um, and being an international organization and actively around the world, we actually have uh, impacts on all of our activities because of the different measures that different countries are taking to manage the pandemic. For us, this means that we are all working from home. So we have been talking to our screens a lot. Uh, so our activities in various countries are uh, being halted or delayed, unfortunately. We were right on the verge of something major happening on the riverside. What what were we doing and where are we right now? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, October 26th of 2019, we were able to uh, first introduce the world to a river program that behind the scenes we were we have been working on uh, creating technology to intercept plastics from rivers since I think 2015 and end of last year we were we were finally able to tell the world what we were doing to show the world that we had systems active in Indonesia in Malaysia uh, we were very close to a installation of a system in the Dominican Republic and then the crisis hit and right now all our operation most of our operational work has come to a standstill and Lonica so so this is this falls under your role a little bit also the safety aspect of this so like, you know, people think safety in terms of what we're doing and obviously we're on yards with cranes and builds happening and we're in the middle of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch floating around on Maersk launchers. And, and by the way, I have to thank you because I was in the Dominican Republic on that last day and I mm -hmm. have a text saying, Lonica says, get your ass off of that island. <laughs> and I looked at it and I thought, well, I thought I was going to be able to get off. I thought I still had like a week. But there's also this aspect of safety, and I'm sure that you had to make some some important calls, you know, and have some big meetings leading up to this. What was it? What was it like for you? Yeah, it hasn't been uh, easy because you keep uh, assessing the situation, which is changing rapidly. Of course, I mean, we have been following um, the epidemic, which it was at the time uh, of this uh, coronavirus, this novel coronavirus, uh, uh, since it started to emerge and become clear that it was uh, a huge thing. Then we had to decide to restrict travel for our team. And that really impacted some of the, the progress that we were making. In general, travel uh, involves uh, a lot of safety considerations for us anyway, because we go to countries where there's a lot of crime and a lot of disease and generally not a very good healthcare system if you end up being uh, uh, sick somewhere. So we already uh, had uh, applied a, a really strict regimen that we wanted to have people be well prepared when they go somewhere and make sure that we know of all the risks and all of the circumstances. We take uh, appropriate measures and we're also always collaborating with a partner locally that is familiar with the circumstances so that we can use whatever is the best knowledge that's available locally. Um, but when this started, we had to slowly start restricting travel. And of course, when it hit Europe in the sense that it did, we had to take very different drastic measures. So we're now all uh, working from home and that is causing um, sometimes humorous situations like working from your ironing boards. It does mean that communication is hard work. 
you don't meet each other in the stairways anymore. You really have to actively seek each other out to uh, make sure that you are connected, that you stay connected. We have to think outside of our normal way. So we are applying our massive creativity within the team, which is really inspiring to see sometimes. Um, and it also means that the, the urgency, the, 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 the reason why we do this is strengthened as well uh, because uh, of this crisis. Actually, there's a lot of signals that the plastic pollution is increasing fast uh, due to economic circumstances, uh, due to uh, reduced waste management, which was in some countries already almost non-existing, etc. So the, the, the need for us to continue um, has become even more clear. Uh, so we will do this. Uh, yeah, but safety is, of course, uh, for our crew, our, our main priority. We need everybody to remain safe and healthy. This this has brought in a whole different like mindset for for the teams as well. How have you seen the teams adapting? Like, how have you seen them taking this challenge on and and not only just being like, oh, you know, now we have to figure out how to work from home or whatever. But you know, a lot of these guys can still design and engineer from computers. And in fact, it, how are they are they taking more focus with this? Yeah, of course, uh, because we can't travel, because our operational work is um, yeah, more difficult at the moment, um, the situation is more difficult. Also, everyone is at home. Uh, what Lonneke already said, communication is, is more difficult because you miss all those little moments just standing at someone's desk and asking one question. We also see a lot of upsides and opportunities, and we also talked about this with the team. Um, and one of the things that everyone keeps mentioning is that we right now we have the time to focus on a way of working. Um, we can build structures and processes that will help us um, when scaling up our operations. So right now we, we have the time to breathe, to look at what we did last year, to, to learn from everything um, and also to work on documentation and uh, make sure that we do all those things that normally in the um, when pro when projects are really running along when you have to meet your deadlines. You don't have time for all those things, but they are really important. So at this moment, a lot of team members see it as also taking a, being able to take a deep breath and reflect. Especially after a year like 2019, right? Yes, <laughs> especially <laughs> after last year. Um, because a lot happened. Uh, people were traveling a lot to get those those two interceptors in the water and to prepare for the for the next two. So um, it's it's difficult. I think people would rather be on the road still, but we are getting a lot of great stuff done to to prepare ourselves uh, for the scale up as an organization. Lonica, where where are we at right now on the ocean side of things? What what's going on presently, and what do you see happening in the near future? The ocean team is really working hard on the developing or improving the design of a next system. So uh, they are working in the different design stages of uh, system number two. Uh, we, we have implemented all the lessons learned that we uh, took from the first mission. And we now need to improve the design on two major topics, which is the system needs to maintain or keep the plastic in for longer periods. So the retention capability of the system needs to be improved, as well as the fact that it needs to be operable through year round conditions in the ocean. So there's two major things we need to work out now. And actually this week is quite exciting because they are doing some of the conceptual tests for this retention mechanism in a basin in the Netherlands where they could do some tests. So we are a bit limited or restricted in the physical activities that we're doing, but they managed to, to come up with a good plan so that we can actually physically test this. So that should give us some exciting answers. So by the end of this week, we are yet in another position than we are now, actually having a bit clearer vision of the way forward to these improvements. So the team is, is working hard and they're using uh, all of their resources creatively and, uh, and, and non-creatively in that sense to really uh, advance this process. That's good. All right, Elena, same thing with the rivers. Where, where are we at with, with we had this huge announcement in October. We talked a little bit about some of the struggles that coronavirus has brought in. But for the most part, it's kind of a different story. I mean, we have working technology that we're putting out there in rivers, right? Yeah, absolutely. We, we need to go global. When you look at the, the problem, 
from our own research, we found that 80% of the pollution comes from 1,000 rivers. So we want those 1,000 rivers solved. And we're looking into the most polluted ones and also the most uh, promising ones to start interceptor projects. And that will be not only in the countries that you have already heard about, but also in other countries in Southeast Asia, other countries in Latin America. And uh, we're also looking at Africa, um, the, the USA uh, and uh, parts of Europe. So um, there, there will be many exciting projects coming up in the, in the next year and the next years. I think one of the coolest countries that we're looking, in, uh, looking at at the moment is Jamaica. We have been offered a grant from the Benioff Ocean Initiative for $1 million to create a project in, with an interceptor in one of Jamaica's most polluted waterways, the Kingston Harbor. So it will be a great project. We will be working together with local organizations uh, to really also look at recycling of the plastic. And also um, we will be working together with a local organization that will use the project to communicate about the problem and about solutions for plastic uh, pollution. So really looking forward to that project too. For us also, um, we are working towards a sort of improved batch of our interceptor system. So the engineering team is working on learning from the field and improving what we have, optimizing the design, finalizing the design uh, to, to make sure that we're really ready for that, that full scale rollout that we want to do. And I do think that, that some of the engineers have the same feeling as, as Lonica just described for the ocean team, that we were able to not really work towards a very strict deadline, but take some more time to really detail out and uh, learn from the field and, and improve upon our uh, current technology and make it even better. So that's that's part of the process. We're working towards a, a new batch of interceptors. And then news from the field, we have one system operating in uh, Jakarta still, or first one. Uh, we were very close to a installation of a system in the Dominican Republic. And then the crisis hit and right now all our operation, most of our operational work has come to a standstill. Tell me about 004. This is like the, the baby to the ocean cleanup. I mean, this was built here in the Netherlands, baptized by none other than Lanika, and sent off in a huge event to the Dominican Republic. What does 004 mean to the ocean cleanup? Yeah, it's it's um, it is a bit of a special case. Even though it's number four, it doesn't sound like it's uh, it should be a special case, but it was indeed because what you highlight, it was uh, assembled fully in the Netherlands, so we could all witness it. Everybody from the team could actually go there and see it evolve into some, yeah, some really neat machine. Mm -hmm. um, and also the, the members of the other teams, huh? because we are working in very designated teams. So people are really focused on their part of the solution. Um, so the people from Ocean or the other teams are not that much involved in the interceptor development, but this was the, the, the opportunity for them to actually physically see it even before the unveil. Um, so it was really, really cool. And you could see the, the, the pride in the engineers showing off their, their yeah, their baby. Uh, so that was really awesome. From my personal perspective, of course, I felt really privileged that I could uh, baptize it. I, um, after more than 20 years in the in the dredging and construct offshore construction industry, I've seen many baptisms uh, and constructions enter into the water, uh, but I've never been, have had the privilege to baptize it. So I was really, really chuffed with that one. Uh, so it is a special one, and of course that this was the model that we started to show the world, which is awesome. These interceptors are very attention seeking, and they're being placed in places that it, they do not fit in with the landscape necessarily. How does that help open the eyes of, say, kids sitting in La Cienega on you know a completely dirty river, and they look out and they see a spaceship in their river? How does it inspire them? Yeah, I think it's always inspiring to see a spaceship, whether it's in a river or in the sky or, or you made it with Lego yourself. When we, when we create a project that works, that actually get plastic out of the water and then actually make sure that the debris that we extract uh, gets handled responsibly um, and is, is put in a right way in the waste management system. When we can show people that it works when you show them a solution, that's inspiring. And by solving the problem, 
by making sure that we we show people that we can actually solve a problem like this, we can also solve other problems and we can ins inspire other people to start working um, on other parts of the problem. Because, yeah, you already mentioned we're, um, we're a small organization. We have great technicians, we have engineers, we have researchers, but we need to work together with, with other organizations that are uh, better in education, that are better in um, creating awareness on political level. So we solve the problem and we inspire others to solve other parts of the problem. That's that's the way I see it. That's the way I think we should work together to solve this whole plastic problem. Uh, yeah, starting with the countries that we're active with and yeah, uh, working towards those those 1000 clean rivers. What what inspires you? Um, what I what I think one of the greatest parts of the ocean cleanup is is that we show that it can be done. Not by creating big plans or big big documents, but we go out there and we do it. We don't wait for for big subsidies or international organizations, but we create a solution. We put it out there. We show people that it works, and uh, we solve part of the problem. And then it's also a cool place to work, right? You get to play with things like you know, rubber ducks, and I mean, t t tell me what's been what's been like the <laughs> highlight for you. And your time at the ocean cleanup. Um, yeah, well, one of the highlights was actually the rubber duck project. <laughs> we had to be able to during the the show really show how the system works, and we thought about okay, we can do this with throwing debris in the river and with showing all kinds of uh, bottles and um, uh, packaged materials, but that would look dirty. And then someone came up with the idea: why don't we use rubber ducks? So then I actually spent quite a lot of time looking into how we can rent over 3,000 rubber ducks, which is actually a thing in the Netherlands. So I drove around the country with a van filled with rubber ducks. I spent, I think, three testing days uh, running around with crates of rubber ducks. We had big rubber ducks in the office that we wanted to use, we wanted to put a GoPro camera on and be able to film from the, from the water. So yeah, I... <laughs> I've never seen so many rubber ducks in my life, and I don't think I will ever do again. <laughs> this is probably true. Lonica, what, what inspires you? Like when you, when you walk around and you have conversations with people at all levels at the Ocean Cleanup, what are the things that make you smile and give you that warm, fuzzy heart feeling? Yeah, my inspiration is always from within the teams. Uh, the overall, the ocean cleanup team, the crew that we have, it's just really cool. Such uh, s special uh, talents that we managed to commit to our mission. Um, I mean, from the, the, the resilience that the ocean team had to show after with the setback with Wilson, uh, which was really inspiring. Um, witnessing like groundbreaking scientific advances every day with our research team. That's really, really cool. Um, uh, indeed, the courage that our waste uh, people have to start this journey from trash to treasure. And yeah, the humor and the creativity that everybody has uh, uh, portrayed by the rubber ducks that Elina mentioned in the, in the unveil, but also like little things like the flux capacitor on the interceptor, etc. It's just, it's, it's fun, it's inspiring, it's awesome. What about the bear that's protecting the headquarters right now? <laughs> yeah, the bear is indeed guarding the office. He's the only uh, one with a <laughs> with a really task in the office at the moment. Of course, we we saw him uh, in the funny video that where we saw Boyan giggle for the first time, which uh, which was quite <laughs> funny. Um, and then the team was so creative that they decided to salvage it and it, it made its debut to the uh, office Christmas party. Uh, so and many different fun facts followed <laughs> after its debut. Yeah, it's really, really funny. What advice would you give to a little girl sitting in, say, you know, Klang, Malaysia, and seeing this interceptor floating in her river? and thinking like, wow, how can I get involved with something like this? Or, or what is this doing and how can I help solve this problem? I think one of the best advices I could give is, is start solving the problems that you see around you. Whether it's um, something in your, your school class you can fix, just 
raise your hand and, and, and be the person that, that takes the initiative to, to get something done, which can be very small, but start yeah, learn how to fix problems, fix your own problems, fix the problems of your class, then your neighborhood, uh, go to a great school, um, get a great education and yeah, look around you for any problems to fix and start working on them. Well, listen, thank you both so much for doing this. And um, for everybody listening and watching, thank you all too. Thank you for your support. We couldn't be doing this stuff if it wasn't for you guys out there. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions or if you have any ideas that you want to send our way, please leave them in the comments or drop them on social media or you'll figure out how to get them to us. You guys know how to do it. All right, thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. All right. All right. Thanks, Dan. Bye-bye. Bye, Lena.